Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Mr. Ditch- Ditchie, it's a pleasure to have you back on the show. Would you mind reintroducing yourself to everyone out there listening? Sure. Uh, my name is Scott Ditchie. I am uh, author of um, nine books now. I lost a little count <laughs> on organized crime. Um, kind of my areas of expertise or specialty are, are Tampa, Florida uh, in general, and uh, New Jersey. Now, is the Tampa influence for organized crime, is that, or the mob, I mean, whichever term you want to use, is that, why is that lesser known? I feel like it's lesser known compared to things like Vegas and Chicago and other kind of places that you hear a lot about. Maybe it's because of the movies. Yeah, I I think there's a, there's a few factors there. One is, you know, for a good part of the, at least the early half of the 20th century, Tampa was not a very big city. People think about Florida up until recently, you know, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, kind of the South Florida area. Um, so I think that's one reason the organized crime, the mob family in Tampa was smaller compared to, say, the five families in New York or the Chicago outfit. Um, and then I think you're right in kind of the pop culture thing has been very New York, Chicago, Vegas kind of focused. Um, you know, there are a lot of small mafia families. There was one in San Jose. There was one in Denver. You know, these these small families that that kind of went under the radar for kind of, uh, you know, general knowledge, like most people have not heard about that. And Tampa falls right in there. Now, what made Tampa's, like, what's the start of it? Take me to the beginning of when there started to be gang activity that was being noticed or when they first got their hold there. Sure. So um, it, it, it kind of dovetails into the creation of, of a, a city that was a city for about a year and change. And then it was incorporated into Tampa called Ybor City. Uh, it's spelled Y-B-O-R. It's not Ybor, it's Ybor. And Ybor City was founded by a cigar maker, Vincente M. Ybor. And he came there and he really kind of spurred on the, the rise of the cigar industry. So with the rise of the cigar industry, you had hundred up to 200, a little over 200 factories. They needed workers. So you had a large a Cuban immigrant population, a large immigration from Spain, but there was also some Sicilian immigration. And some of the Sicilian immigrants that came um in through Tampa already had connections with some other Sicilian gangland figures that have already been in the United States. Also, you had um, people coming over from New Orleans into Tampa that that were connected, if you will. But interestingly, the first kind of mob boss or the first kingpin of organized crime in Tampa was was not a mafia Sicilian mafioso. He was a um, a blue blood uh, Tampa related to some of the prominent like founding families of Tampa. So there there was already kind of an appetite there for vice uh, in Tampa. So in the by the early 1900s, certainly by by the time prohibition comes around, you already have a lot of um, different groups engaged in kind of different types of organized crime activity. Now, was there a lot of bootlegging going on just because of the prohibition era or were there other, because I think you mentioned, I've heard you mentioned a couple of times, which was like drug trafficking. I don't know if that comes later, but it's something that a lot of people, like I wasn't aware of. And I'm like, wait, that happened in, that happened in Tampa. That, 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 that sounds like something that happened in like uh, New Orleans, I would think just because of the docks down there. So yeah, so Port Tampa Bay was, was already a pretty thriving port by the time prohibition starts. And you already had a, a, a trade with Havana. There were a lot of very close connections between Tampa and Havana. And because of that, um, Tampa becomes a big port of entry for illegal rum, uh, for molasses, for sugar that's used in distillery operations. You also have a lot, uh, two other commodities, drugs, you mentioned before, narcotics, huge trafficking in narcotics through Port Tampa Bay. In fact, I think it was a, um, a state legislative report in Florida in 1925 said Tampa was second only to New York City in the importation of illegal drugs into the United States. It was primarily heroin at that time, uh, some morphine, some marijuana, a little bit of coke, but primarily heroin. And then uh, they were also bringing in a lot of illegal aliens, illegal immigrant smuggling through Tampa via Havana was also really big business. And this was all around that prohibition era, you know, 20 to 30, mid 30s. Now, when you think of that time period, you think of alcohol. Usually you don't think of other drugs and things, especially heroin. When I heard you mention heroin, I think I listened to a podcast episode you were on. You mentioned that. I was like, that's crazy because I do not associate that drug with gangsters. You know, we always picture the suits and the things you kind of see on TV with the Tommy guns. But you kind of gave a different depiction of what the mob was using down there. Yeah. You know, one of the great myths of organized crime and the mafia is that the mob 
were never involved in drugs. And actually, it's the polar opposite. They were heavily involved, especially in the early years. Um, I'll do a quick plug. I was interviewed on a, a great documentary called Dope Men that's out on Amazon. Uh, my friends, uh, Kristen Cipollini and uh, Seth Ferrante did it. And really, that's what it does. It exposes kind of how uh, intertwined organized crime was with drug traffic in the, in the early part of the 20th century. And, and Tampa was, was uh, you know, as I mentioned before, a, a big player in that in that traffic who were the prime figures that were involved in the drug trafficking and did they were they interested in drugs themselves like using it or is it just about selling and trafficking the drugs well as i mentioned before the first underworld kingpin of tampa was not a sicilian mob guy or a cuban or spanish denizen of ebor he grew up kind of a blue blood of tampa his name was charlie wall and he gets not only involved in narcotics trafficking but becomes a morphine addict himself so answers your question there on that. Uh, and then some of his lieutenants, guys like George Zarate, who's a Cuban underworld figure involved in narcotics. Uh, and then you start seeing some um, mafioso become involved. Uh, the Ignacio Antonori, who's the boss of the Tampa Mafia from 1930 to 1940, has a pipeline that is bringing drugs into Tampa and um, up to Kansas City with help from the Kansas City mob. So uh, there were a lot of different groups that, that had their hands in narcotics at that time. Now, was there a kind of consciousness amongst people that understood that there was this drug trafficking going on there? Or was it really not really focused on? Because I don't think the mob technically didn't legally exist until later when it was finally acknowledged. Yeah, it was, it was more like, they would, you know, you, you see in the newspapers, like, you know, gangsters or underworld figures or gangland figures, they would call them. But there were some raids. Um, there was a there was a big raid in 1928. On a, a pretty major narcotics operation. So um, the, people were aware that this was going on. It, it wasn't something that was like totally kept under the rug. But, you know, like anything kind of dies over time, the the knowledge of it. So when I tell people about it now, you know, 100 years later, they're like, what? I, that happened? Uh, so, but yeah, it. Um, you know, there were people that knew what was going on. There were certainly uh, their law enforcement to some extent was, was on top of some of it. Um, and as you probably know, during the Prohibition era, there was a lot of, um, you know, paying off of police and stuff to look the other way. But there was some law enforcement effort against uh, especially the narcotics activity in Tampa. So did the Narcotics Bureau recognize the mob's influence or existence way before the FBI's exist or acknowledge their existence? Yeah, yes. Um, that's been borne out by research over the years. In fact, um, it's maybe about 10 years ago, there was a book of a uh, of uh, Bureau of Narcotics Files, um, and you can tell that they were they were a little bit further ahead than the FBI in recognizing that this concept of a national mafia syndicate and, and certainly their involvement in narcotics. Now, did they ever have a gang war? I mean, how many gangs were involved in Tampa at the time, or was it just one primary family? So between 1928 and 1940, there's a, about 50 gangland killings, shootings, attempted assassinations. And it's primarily between the mafia <clears throat> and some of their Cuban Spanish allies. And then Charlie Wall and his group, which were also kind of a mixed bag of, of uh, different um, different people. But those were the two main kind of uh, organized crime enterprises. And they were basically shooting at each other for control of, of the rackets. And when the smoke cleared in 1940, um, even though Charlie Wall came out unscathed after three assassination attempts, he was he was on a little bit of a weakened position. That's when um, the, the mafia kind of get the upper hand, the traficantes move into the picture. So that those so things start changing and Charlie Wall kind of gets pushed to the side at that point. Now, did Charlie Wall have a revenge or any type of disagreement with Santos Traficante Sr.? No, in fact, um, Santos Sr. kind of pushes Charlie Wall out of the picture and um, and kind of says, hey, stay out of the way. And as long as you stay out of the way, nothing, you know, as long as I'm alive, nothing's going to happen to you. So so Charlie Wall lives another 15 years. And um, but, you know, he does some interesting things. He testifies in front of the Kefauver Commission about yeah. organized crime in Tampa. Um, I talked to some police during that time and Charlie Wall would get drunk at clubs and start bad mouthing the mafia and uh and the mobs basically some own some clubs, so you're basically oh absolutely, mob but right next but the there year. was this kind of aura of invincibility that Charlie Wall had because Santos said, "Hey, nothing's going to happen to you while I'm alive." Well, he Santos Senior dies in August of '54, and not eight months later, Charlie Wall's found in the 
back bedroom of his house by his wife with his with his throat cut and his head bashed in. Um, still an unsolved murder on the books, uh, but you know it's <laughs> telling that you know the, the mafia guys were holding grudges for a long period of time because they waited that long to to take out Charlie Wall. And keep in mind, he was not a force at all to be reckoned with at that point. This was purely a uh, kind of a personal grudge or vendetta killing. Now, did the original Tampa mob start to change, or did you see more actions being done with Traficante's family moving in? One of the things I think it did, well, t taking a little step back, um, the Tampa Mafia were always aligned with other Mafia families around the country. In, in 1928, there was a, a raid of a meeting of bootleggers at the Hotel Statler in Cleveland, Ohio, and two of the people arrested, Ignacio Italiano and Joe Viglicia, were Tampa residents. In fact, Ignacio Italiano was was probably the first like real true mafia boss in Tampa. So by the time the Traficantes kind of take the picture, they really kind of solidify even more this connection with the New York families, with Chicago, with New Orleans. And the other thing they do is they kind of bring in some of the independent Cuban and Spanish um, Belita operators and Belita is a form of illegal gambling uh, under their wing. So um, so they really start kind of solidifying their power. Um, now, there's another spate of violence in the early 50s, and that's kind of a, a more internal within the family. Uh, for and, and that's more of a, um, yeah, the Traficanes on one side and Salvatore Italiano and, and his faction on the other. And it was kind of vying for power internally. But but the Traficanes maintained the upper hand throughout most of that and certainly uh, were the dominant kind of name, at least certainly in organized crime in Tampa. Would you consider Traficante Sr. Uh, an effective mob figure compared to maybe some of the other more well-known ones like Jimmy Hoffa, uh, Meyer Lansky, um, ones that everyone's kind of heard over and over again? I mean, it's hard to make that comparison. I saw your face on that one. But Traficante Sr., I mean, you or your book, The Silent Don, I mean, he does do a lot of things without being the flashy character up front and kind of wanting the publicity. Some of these figures look like they wanted the publicity. Yeah, well, now keep in mind, Santo Senior only he's only boss from 1940 to about 1950, and his son Santo Junior takes over in 50. Um, but they're very similar in a sense. Well, Santo Junior we know a lot more about because of the FBI getting involved in investigating and some other things. There's very little known about the reign of Santo Senior. There, there's very little uh, primary source information. There's very little law enforcement information. There's very little even newspaper coverage. Um, so. If you go 10 years with being the boss and nobody ever talks about you, I would consider that that's probably it. kind of uh, kind of successful. And then even when Santo Jr. takes over, you know, even though he's, you know, front and center in the newspaper a lot and he's definitely a more well-known figure, he also, you know, skates away without any spending any time in prison, um, really kind of avoids a lot of major uh, prosecution. Yeah, the the only time Santo Traficante Jr. ever spent any time in prison was when he was detained in uh, in Cuba after Castro took over. But he never spent any time in, in American prison. You said Junior, right? Junior, correct. And Santo Senior never spent any time in prison either. So. so, so was there an original print? Like, did they did Senior help bring Junior into leading the business, kind of groom him in a way to be take charge? And who was the one that originally had the plan to go to? Cuba and start gambling operations over there. So to your first point, yeah, Santo Senior. So Santo Senior had five sons, um, and Santo Junior was not the oldest, but he was the namesake, and he turned out the, the most capable of the brothers in terms of kind of that that criminal enterprise. Um, so we yeah, call it uh, class, San class. Yeah. So Santo Senior kind of raises him, or and kind of brings him into the fold. Um, and then, you know, Cuba now, the, the Tampa mob had been active in Cuba since the Prohibition era, um, as well as like Lansky and some of the New York guys. But um, really, the thing that kickstarts the, the, the gambling enterprises to kind of that next level is in, in post-World War II, Havana becomes a very popular tourist place for, for Americans to go. It's even now from Tampa, it's a 50 minute flight. So it's, you know, it's a relatively close destination. You have the gambling, you have the nightclubs, you have, you know, nice beaches, everything's there. So as, as that starts growing, the mafia, including the Tampa mafia, start um, investing in hotels. Uh, they start investing in, in real estate and other more legitimate enterprises. And 
the reason that the Tampa Mafia and Santo Traficante Jr. in particular were so effective is really a function of the fact that the neighborhoods they grew up in, Ybor City, West Tampa, they all spoke Spanish. They grew up around a Cuban culture, so they understood that much better than, say, Meyer Lansky or Lucky Luciano or a guy you know from Chicago. So that gave them a leg up. Um, and they were able to really kind of expand their empire there in Havana. And the other thing, it was it was legitimate money. You know, they kind of looked at it as this is our chance to kind of you know run legitimate casinos and such. What what happened when Castro eventually kicked all the mob figures out? Because I think he was trying to reclaim his territory, he just wanted to get all those operations and all these mob figures out of there. But how did that affect business when it came to Santos Traficante? It seemed like he had, from the documents I've seen, a large focus on trying to reclaim his territory back there. Yeah, so Fidel Castro moves in after New Year's Eve 1959, and he closes the casinos. They, they kind of trash the casinos, and a lot of the mafia guys leave. Traficante stays. And what happens is a lot of people don't know, about a month later in February of 59, um, Castro reopens the casinos because all the workers, all the Cuban workers, like, hey, that's our, this is our job. We need money. We need to make a living. However, because of everything going on there, there were no tourists. So Traficante wants to kind of hang out for a while and see how things go. So what happens is that there's pressure from the American government to Castro to jail Traficante, which they do. They jail him for, for a certain amount of time. And then he's released by late 59. And then he comes back to the United States. And, and with that, you know, he gets involved in some of the Cuba CIA plots against Castro. He has emissaries trying to work to get back into not only Cuba, but other places in Central America and South America. And what's kind of interesting is, uh, I, I think, Traficante never had involvement in Vegas, and I think because he was so focused in the 60s on getting back into either Cuba or another uh, Caribbean-type casino venture, that he kind of misses the boat on, on Vegas at the time when all the other mafia families are, you know, they had been there since the beginning, but really started investing again heavily in, into Vegas in, in the 60s. Now, now, do you think if he would have hopped on the Vegas adventure with everybody else that he would have had a better chance at least becoming more or raising up his mafia family a little bit when it comes to illegal gambling operations because i mean the drug trafficking can make you a good amount of money but it seems like everybody kind of doubled down on the whole gambling operations avenue yeah and and the tampa mafia gambling was always probably their biggest bread and butter money maker um but yeah you know hypothetically he probably could have ridden out the 60s in vegas and then when you know things start changing in the 70s um you know, the government gets more involved, starts kicking the mob out of Vegas and Howard Hughes comes in, you know, all those that stuff starts to happen and changes kind of the makeup of organized crime in Vegas. Um, you know, he would have been older at that time, so maybe kind of back away. But uh, yeah, it, that would have been interesting to see if he, he had a seat at that table with some of the other mafia families that were active in Vegas at the time. Now, which members were was Junior connected to of other families? Um, I, I mean, and also, what's his relationship, if you know, of any with William Harvey? Because um, I know that was the whole CIA operations and things like that. But even with like names like Howard Hughes, he's friends with Robert Mayhew, who was connected to. I mean, was kind of like the go between to the mob, mostly like with Johnny Roselli and other figures. So I'm wondering how long is their friends list or contact list on their cell phone? You know. So, yeah, I wouldn't say Mayhew and Trev County were friends because, you know, I talked to Mayhew at length and and he was really there on behalf of the CIA to set up that meeting with Giancana Roselli and, and Trev County, the Fountain Blue. So he told me, at least Mayhew did, that he only met Trev County a few times. And it really was in the guise, like you said, of this kind of the CIA reaching out to the mafia through Roselli and, and especially Trev County having contacts. And the other interesting thing about Trev County is, not only when he was in, he was probably one of the only mob guys that did this. When he was in Cuba, he partnered with some local Cuban mafia figures that were, you know, native to the island. And when Castro takes over, a lot of those guys move to Miami and they start working with Traficante, who has kind of like a separate Cuban mafia family that works with him in Miami. And some of those guys get involved in the Bay of Pigs invasion. Some of those guys get involved in... Um, some of these anti-Castro activities with the CIA. So, it, you know, Traffic County suddenly finds himself in this murky kind of geopolitical world of, uh, of that, the early mid-60s with that.
How many people have you interviewed when it comes to finding out information on Traficante Jr.? Well, I, quite a few. Um, like I said, I interviewed Mayhew, obviously, before he passed. Uh, I'm he, jealous he was, of that. That's crazy. Yeah, he was pretty open. I forget. It was a long time ago. This was back like 2005, um, 2004, maybe even. I forget exactly how I got his number, but I called him. I just called him. Um, but there's guys that I wish I would have interviewed, like Frank Regano. He passed before I started doing research. Um, R.D. Matthews, who I didn't realize was alive up until a few years ago. And I kicked myself for not like, you know, looking at some of these other tangential figures that were involved in whether it was the CIA plots or, you know, tied in with with Traficante in Cuba and find themselves kind of in, you know, a JFK conspiracy or or some of these other things. So, um, but, uh, you know, we're in 2024. A lot of those guys aren't around anymore. So if, if I get any leads of anyone that's still alive, I certainly try to at least uh, at least see if they're willing to to talk. Did anybody give you information about Traficante Jr. that you found interesting or maybe it was a different viewpoint or perspective than maybe some of the other interviews you've had? A lot of them were, a lot of those things were more, and I like doing this, what was he really like as a person? You know, there's the mafia stuff, there's that aspect, but, you know, talking to people that knew him, talking to people that, you know, remember him, like coming in the restaurant or giving money to their kids or, you know, lending them a car, you know, just those little kind of mundane anecdotal kind of stories about what he was like as a, as a person, how he interacted with people, how he was viewed by some people. Um, I, I talked to a reporter in the early 80s, and he was at a uh, – Traficante was on trial in Tampa, and he went to a restaurant near the federal courthouse in downtown Tampa. And um, this reporter went up to him as Traficante was eating and said, Mr. Traficante, I'd like to interview you or talk to you. And Traficante said something effective I'm eating. And the, the reporter tried to ask him another question, and the reporter said he – Traficante just like looked up and lifted his eyebrow, and the reporter's like, I got chills. I walked away, <laughs> you know. Just like tiny little things like that, I, I find fascinating, um, you know, in terms of like global, like, you know, things that were like, oh, my God, I can't believe he was involved in that. I, I think I think finding out about his involvement with a lot of these Cuban gangsters um, in the in the 1960s in Miami was was really revelatory because that that later becomes kind of the impetus for like the cocaine cowboy era of Miami um, on, on the Cuban side. And, um, you know, Traficante wasn't involved in any of that. I, and I think the mafia in general missed out on the cocaine era, uh, certainly in South Florida. But uh, yeah, there's these weird threads. And, you know, it's great connecting those threads that like there's a guy over here and there's a guy over here. And, oh, wow, they both know Traficante or, you know, they have those little connections. Now, what about when it comes to like if I were going to examine maybe Howard Hughes and the different Las Vegas mob? I know it's a little bit kind of different than obviously Tampa, but I'm wondering how they defer. Like when you look at like gambling being kind of like that's the focal point everybody thinks of when they think of Vegas. And Howard Hughes started buying it, the casinos up from all these older uh, gangsters. But the older gangsters like Meyer Lansky and all these figures that are just kind of prominent names that everybody knows. I mean, how did they defer from Junior, uh, Traficante Junior? Uh, you mean like what made them stand out differently in, in Vegas? In yeah. Like it seems like yeah. everybody's got their own like little thing. Even it could be a funny hat, but it's just something about the way that they did business or the way that they ran things that was a little bit different than the other. Yeah. So, the you know, I think I think the real successful Vegas guys like Mo Dalitz or Longies Willman in the 50s or Jerry Katina or Lansky, um, yeah, e even some of like the Kansas City guys that were involved in the skim, the, you know, I, I think they're their operations were, were were really designed more to be in the shadows in, in terms of like ownership of casinos. But like a guy like Mo Dalitz, I think he won Mr. Las Vegas one year. He transforms himself from this prohibition era bootlegger into this kind of like a grandfather of Las Vegas. And he, he actually is involved in casinos in a legitimate um, manner, you know, and then Hughes comes and he, he buys a lot of these old mobbed up casinos and some of those mob guys made out pretty well there's there's the you hear it a lot in vegas is the you know it was better when the mob ran it and you know to some extent maybe from a customer service perspective it, it might have been better uh but but you know the mafia made a lot of money from vegas a lot of money from skimming the casinos and it, it was you know it was kind of a cash cow for them for a very long time
It was a big tax break, wasn't it, too? Because they were offering, well, at least for Howard Hughes it was. He was offering to build things to make Vegas better that was going to better feed the economy of Vegas. And he would get like every adventure you could look at Howard Hughes that he was involved in, at least um, when it came to him being hands on. It failed, but a lot of it was just like, oh, give me some time. I'm going to build this new airliner system that's going to bring a bunch of jobs to the community. Never got built. Just 20 years, just wasted, just waiting and waiting and waiting. You never had to pay taxes. Yeah, yeah. There's a, a fantastic book, a, a friend of mine, Jeff Schumacher, he's a vice president of exhibits and um, events at the Mod Museum in Vegas. He wrote a fantastic bio of Howard Hughes that focuses just on his Vegas era. And he, he updated it like a couple of years ago. And Is it called um, Empire? I, I really recommend it. It goes into a lot of a lot of really interesting detail about um, Hughes's time in Vegas and and like what what was the you know the end result coming out of that and you mentioned before Robert Mayhew was really close to to Hughes in Vegas at that time as well so yeah interesting you, connection you mentioned the committee before that Charlie Wall testified in could you maybe explain a little bit to the people out there listening that might not know what that committee is I mean I know about the Veloce hearings which we can talk about if you'd like to but there's only a few things with the mob that I've known seen them in court. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the Kefauver hearings took place in 1950, and I think they bled into 51. Um, and there was a senator from Tennessee, Estes Kefauver, and he he was in charge of this committee. And they it was really to look at the influence of organized crime in politics and just looking at some of the cities where organized crime was active. And I forget the official name, but most people, you can look up Kefauver Committee, uh, K-E-F-A-U-V-E-R. And what it was, it was really the first like congressional hearings that really looked at organized crime and actually called a lot of mobsters up to testify. The other thing that coincides with this is television starting to gain traction as this medium. Now more people have TVs and they televise some of these. And, and the, the famous one is they televise the senators grilling Frank Costello, the mafia boss Frank Costello. And the camera kind of focuses on his uh, his fingers, and you can tell he's tapping. He's nervous, like answering these questions. And he has this one great quip. I think a senator asked him, and I'm slightly paraphrasing, asked him some of the effect of, you know, what makes you a good American? And Frank Costello says, "Well, I pay my taxes." And everyone like laughs in the gallery. But because this was, you know, televised for the first time, this you know was good TV. All of a sudden, you're seeing these gangsters you hear about. Some of them, you know, being grilled by a congressional committee under oath. Yeah, to me, it's surprising. I mean, it shows that there was a public awareness, at least when it came to media focusing on talking about them. But did it, like from your perspective, do you think that had some type of impact on the way that people viewed organized crime? Like now that they're being able to see them kind of joke instead of just being like these terrifying stories that you hear about? I think it demystifies it somewhat because up until that point, your, you know, your viewpoint of gangsters is pre predominantly Hollywood. You know, whether it's Edgar G. Robinson or James Cagney or some of these, you know, the film noir movies. And now you see them for what they really are. And I, I think it kind of cuts through the mystique of them and, and certainly see them being grilled by by senators and pleading the fifth. They're like stumbling through answers that kind of, you know, I don't say takes them down a notch, but kind of, you know, you can view them now as not these mythic, all powerful, you know, secret society. Now they're like, oh, OK, here's a guy on TV who's nervous about answering questions about how he makes money. Now, was it just exposure of politics that the mob was connected to, or was that committee also exposed things of just regular businesses and things like? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, there was, um, you know, details into what kind of legitimate businesses they were involved in, um, connections between mafia families, and, and connections with uh, illegal gambling, the race wire at that time. So it did kind of bring up a lot of other things that that were tangential and, and really kind of exposed how deeply the mafia were involved in in all different aspects from you know, everything from organized labor to to legitimate businesses that that a lot of these guys owned. Just in a little aside from Traficante Jr., but what are your thoughts on Jimmy Hoffa? I've kind of seen his perspective change from certain historians that view him as not just effective, but I mean, he really helped out the teams or not teamsters, the the truckers, the truckers when they were doing their protests and things like that. And I know that's kind of an unpopular opinion, I'd say. But if you're examining, I guess, from besides all the gangster stuff, yeah, he's funneling money. But if you look at what his whole thing for the Teamsters Union of what he was doing uh, when it came to getting uh, kind of better rights and conditions for those truckers, that was pretty interesting to me to find out that a mob figure did that. Yeah, I I don't know. 
I'm I'm not definitely not a, a big I would say historian or expert in Hoffa. So I I have somewhat of a maybe more disconnected perspective, but but I think you bring up a good point that you know certainly in the early years of the foundation of the Teamsters Union, he was instrumental in getting the union to what it was and, and working for workers' rights uh, at that time. And then you know things change and he get and suddenly finds himself in bed with with prime figures and uh, he's lending the money to build casinos in Vegas. You know, a lot of those casinos in Vegas were built with money from the ten, uh, Teamsters Pension Fund. And uh, there, there's a couple good books uh, that have been written over the years about Hoffa and, and how he kind of gets involved, you know, irrespective of the whole theories of his death and, you know, that, but like how he lived his life. Uh, interesting tie to Traficante is that they shared a lawyer, Frank Regano, for a while. Um, who was Traficani's attorney. Frank Regano was a Tampa attorney and uh, he he worked with with Hoffa for a little while. Um, and I've seen a few connections where, where Hoffa would meet with Traficani, but Hoffa's um, really, his ties to organized crime were primarily through the D Detroit mob and through some of the guys in New York, New Jersey, you know, like Tony Provenzano, certainly a name I think a lot of people have heard. Um, so yeah, he was a definitely an interesting figure. That that's for sure. What could what would you have asked Frank Regano if he had the opportunity to? I would have asked him, did Santo really, did Santo really confess to him that he killed Kennedy? Uh uh, and that'd be but you know, he'd probably give the same answer. Just, you know, what was it like being around not only Traficani, but some of the other guys in the Tampa family he represented? What were some of the nuances of of how he approached defending them, you know, kind of a little bit more of the minutia stuff that, that I like that, you know, you can read the broad brushes and newspapers and book. Um, he wrote a book mob lawyer, but, you know, getting to know more, more detailed information, especially, you know, dealing with Santo on a day-to-day -day basis, was he really kind of as quiet and, you know, kind of astute as he comes off to being by other people I've interviewed. So but yeah, he passed away in 98 and I really started researching my stuff like, early 99. I was the first person I looked up and I'm like, oh, damn, missed him by, you know, a couple of, you know, like a year he passed away. But I did get a chance to interview his family and and his wife. So I, do, I was able to get some, you know, information from them that was helpful. I know on your first episode, we focused a lot into the Kennedy stuff because that's where a lot of my knowledge on Traficante was just coming from mm -hmm. looking at the documentation. But I do think he knocked off Johnny Roselli. I think there was something there that gives me a little bit of like, I don't know, I put a lot of weight into it. Not Carlos Marcello, but Traficante, uh, knock it off Johnny Roselli for sure. Yeah, I I, I mean, I, I think there's probably some good circumstantial evidence. At, at the very least, at the very least, Traficante knew and he was alerted or aware of what was going to happen to Roselli. Um, you know, they had lunch like right before Roselli goes, goes missing. Uh, this happens right around the time of the House Select Committee on Assassination. So there, there's a lot of coincidences there. But but e even taken out for a minute, if, if Traff Gundy wasn't directly involved, he certainly was aware of what was going to happen. And I think he probably would have, just out of respect, whoever, whether it was Chicago that was behind it, um, would have come to him and gotten his blessing to to make that happen. So Now, with a lot of popular mob deaths that have happened publicly, whether it's assassination, whether it's a shooting, whether... A lot of people don't know that Traficante Jr. got shot. I heard you mention it before, and I didn't know that information either. Yeah, he was shot in the arm in January of 53. He was walking out of his house to his car. Um, his bodyguard, John, uh, Jimmy Longo, was there. So again, in the early 50s, when, when Santo Jr. really starts to assert his leadership, there's a couple other wise guys locally that are like, hey, wait, we want a piece of this. So there's a, there's some internal shootings. There's a couple killings that happen around this time, and um, that January '53 shooting of of Traficante, um, yeah, he was only minorly injured, and supposedly the gunman was Joe Antonori, and he's killed later on. Um, so Traficante does kind of exact his revenge against the the, the reputed uh, person who shot him. But yeah, he so yeah, it, and you know, funny enough, it it's doesn't really come up a lot in kind of general conversations about Traficante, but it was it was pretty big news in Tampa, certainly. Now, when it comes to like the media's reception or at least reporting, is Traficante ever hit global news or at least uh, all over the United States, or was it just specifically Tampa that was getting a lot of maybe if there was press attention? No, I uh, Traficante, I think. Um, 
I think uh, certainly at the House Select Committee in 78, his name gets thrown around a lot. Um, in, in the early 60s, he's listed as, uh, you know, kind of the kingpin of organized crime in Florida. Certainly Florida news, whether it was uh, Tampa or Miami or Orlando, was more Traficante, but you know, there were definitely a lot of national news pieces. Um, probably one of the biggest is in the early 70s when Jack Anderson at the Washington Post um, gets Johnny Roselli to admit about these the CIA mafia plots and you know, Traficante's name's all over that. So he definitely gets picked up on the AP wire, his name, uh, and it, it's batted around a lot. So I would say, you know, he enjoys this period of relative anonymity outside Tampa. And then in the 60s really starts kind of getting kicked up to more of a national figure. Now, was there an, ever an investigation into some of these mob figures deaths of leading back to Santos Traficante? I can't find much on Roselli, but like I think with Carlos Marcello, a lot of people point to some, not Traficante, but some other figure that like everyone suspects that it is. Because I don't know if you know much about Carlos Marcello's death. Um, but oh, no, he, he died. Was... Carlos Marcello died. Uh, natural causes. Natural causes? Yeah, he died in. Oh, uh, no, I'm so sorry. I'm saying Carlos Marcello. Sam Giancana. Oh, yeah, I get Sam those Giancana. names yes, mixed yes, yes, up. Yes, yeah, they yeah. got a, everyone's got their own little pizzazz to their name. But yeah, Sam Giancana's death, 100%. I like, I think they have it narrowed down to a certain mob figure that it could be because it had to be someone close to him, right? Because he was making peppers in his house. I'm, I'm thinking of the name of who they think it was. Butch Blossy, maybe? It I starts know, with a B. It starts yeah, with a B. I know that. It. Um, yeah, so they they believe that was a Chicago internal, like you said. You know, he was in his house, and somebody came in, so it was definitely somebody he knew, and and killed him. And you know, to to your point, um, Roselli, there was a pretty robust investigation. Um, I have copies of some of the like uh, questionnaires that they you know they brought in all these mob guys in South Florida to question them, but never really went anywhere. Um, certainly going back to like the fifties and, you know, the Tampa era, there's not a single one of those murders that have been solved. Um, so yeah, I, I still think there's, you know, things have changed dramatically nowadays, certainly with forensic evidence and, and, you know, the advancement of science and, in criminology, uh, which you didn't have, certainly didn't have back in the fifties. I mean, you had some of it, but it wasn't what it is today. Um, but even in the seventies still, you know, you, you see more and more, um, solved but until you in a lot of cases until you get like a snitch or somebody that turns state's evidence and like openly gives more information or says hey i know who killed so and so um you know I, th I think as time goes by a lot of those murders will remain unsolved especially the older ones but even with their political influence they were still being monitored by like the fbi like there was wiretaps going on in sam giancana's house mm -hmm. um and other places as well too was uh traficante jr ever being monitored or wiretapped by the fbi yeah yes quite a bit um he didn't say much on wiretap there's very scant wiretap um stuff on santo traficante there there's a lot more just general surveillance following him around um, this story, this FBI agent told me, um, cause Traff County moved to Miami in the sixties for, for a good amount of time and into the seventies lived in Miami a lot. And this FBI agent would come by every day to follow him. And then one day Santo came out of the house and went in the backseat of the FBI car and was like, well, you, you follow me every day. You might as well just drive me to where I need to go. <laughs> uh, that's, that's funny. Uh, when we talk about Traficante, I mean, what would you say were some areas of speculation when it came to acts or deaths or any types of in violence that might have happened that could be kind of not 100% Traficante, but it seems more than likely that it was? Well, it's you know, I think question, but... no, no, I, I see exactly where you're going with this. You know, I think his name gets attached to a lot of the Tampa murders, but I think in the context of the organization that was going on, that, that's probably, you know, that's not too out there a claim. Um, but, you know, obviously I think the, 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 you know, the elephant in the room is the JFK assassination. I get asked that almost every single time on one of my tours. I got asked it last night on one of my Tampa mafia tours, you know, people like, I heard he killed Kennedy. <laughs> well, no, he didn't kill Kennedy. Um, but was he part of some larger conspiracy? Did he know people? Did he know Jack Ruby? Did he, you know, Yes, to a lot of those questions, but it, you know you can't really definitively say he was the one that gave the order. Um, so I think you know that's probably the one where his name gets attached to. That um, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence, but you know obviously you know there's no no pun intended. There's no smoking gun uh, on that. 
Um, the other one, I think, you know, you mentioned Roselli. Roselli is something his name gets attached to. We don't have a lot of information on that. I, I think it's likely that, like I said, if he wasn't involved, he was um, at least alerted or gave his blessing. Uh, and then Albert Anastasia, when Albert Anastasia is killed in 1957, um, Jeff is in the same hotel. He checks out Anastasia is killed like a few hours later. Uh, he's named as a main suspect in the Anastasia murder. He's um, pulled up in front of a grand jury in New York. In reality, I don't think he had anything to do with Albert Anastasia's murder. I, Albert Anastasia was killed as part of an internal Gambino family uh, conflict. I think that was really more weird coincidence. Um, uh, he had met with Anastasia while he was in New York. Traficante did, uh, but I don't think he was involved in the shooting. But again, probably something they said, hey, just so you know, <laughs> this is going to happen. Or uh... I'm I'm with you on the Kennedy stuff. I don't think he did anything with Kennedy, but it is interesting when you kind of looked at like he I think the HSCA even concluded that he had the motive and the means, but they don't think he did it. But then they also said the same thing about Sam Giancana and they said the same thing about uh, Jimmy Hoffa and others. Uh, but just to hear their name tossed around, then it is linked to one of these giant subjects, the Kennedy case or the Kennedy conspiracy. Um when you do your tours, I mean, it, does it interest you at all when you look at some of the, like, you get the questions about the Kennedy stuff and you kind of know the history or at least some of the relationship that went on with Jack Ruby? Yeah, and that's kind of how I answer that question because, you know, my my tour in Ybor City is really more germane to the locations in Ybor, but, but we get asked questions about stuff like that. So, you know, I just, I leave them with that. I said, you know, I leave them with kind of the cliffhanger of this visit by Jack Ruby to Traficante and Triscorni and Havana and say, that now you guys can go do your own <laughs> deep dive. Um, Cause it really, you know, it's a subject you can't answer in a five minute soundbite early, but, uh, but yeah, there there's, and to me, that's the most fascinating part is it's almost irrelevant to me who killed Kenny. Was it Oswald alone? Was there, you know, another gunman? It's all this other stuff around that's going on at the same time. It's the CIA mafia plots. It's, you know, the intelligence community working with the mafia. It's these connections between the mafia and these anti-Castro soldier of fortunes and all this kind of stuff. It's it's that that to me is the much more fascinating aspect of that whole story. And and Traficante is in the middle of a lot of that. About a year ago, I asked you this question. I would like to see if your answer has changed. But when it comes to the CIA uh, plots against Castro, um, do you think it? Do you think he had it inside, man? Traficante did, because there was pills that was delivered to Sam Giancana to give to Castro that never fully fulfilled. Um, I think you froze on my. About a year ago, I asked you this question. Um, I'm curious if your answer has changed on it. But when it comes to the CIA Castro assassination plots. Traficante, Gene Connor, all these figures that were involved, whether it was poison pills being delivered. But do you believe that Traficante might have been had an in with Castro? I mean, they had so many attempts that ended up failing and it became a theory out there that somehow how did Traficante get released from Castro's prison? And there was a lot of things that just weren't making sense, like how many of these crazy assassination plots could fail? So, yeah, Charles Siragusa, the famed DEA agent, thought that. Santo was a double agent for Castro. There are a lot of people at that time. If you read um, surveillance reports, there was a lot of scuttlebutt on the street that Traficante was playing both sides. Um, and, and there's a part of me, a big part of me that thinks that he had no intentions of ever doing anything against Castro, that he was just taking the money from the CIA, which is, you know, a pretty wise guy thing to do. <laughs> just take the money, walk away. Um, but I, th I think there are some definite threads of evidence that Traficante still had connections on Cuba and he was still looking to get in and maybe saw, you know, siding up with Castro as an opportunity, maybe also involved in the anti-Castro. So basically kind of looking at things from both sides and not unlike what the mafia did when Castro was warned against Batista in Cuba, you know, people, and I think we might've talked about this last year, but if you haven't seen that, you know, there were mafia guys that were giving guns to Castro, too. And it was kind of like playing both sides of oh, he wins, he'll be our friend, too, which didn't turn out to be right. So anyway, getting back to your question, um, that's a really interesting thing. And the, the more I think about it, the more I think it's probably some truth in that, that he he might have had thing. He might have had connections on both sides. 
the prison when Castro locked up Traficante in prison, when he gets released, was that any blowback to his reputation as a boss? Because I want to talk about some significant events, not just in Traficante's life, but significant events in your minds that stand out to points you would point to people when it comes to, I don't know, just impacts into changes of the way the mob kind of ran or just their acknowledgement to the general public. I mean, we're going to get to the Appalachian meeting at a point, but those are what I would call significant events. I mean, Traficante to me getting locked up is a significant event because we don't really ever hear about mob figures getting locked up, even when Jimmy Hoffa was in there. What was it? Uh, Nixon pardoned them. So it's like, what's going on? Like, that's a headline news right there. Why is the president pardoning this mafia guy or mob figure? Well, I, it didn't really make a ton of news because it was in Cuba. I think had that been in the United States, it might have been a different story. Um, and it was, you know, it was really for a short period of time. It was less than a year. And he comes back and he hits the ground running. Nothing's changed um, in terms of his prominence in the underworld. If anything, it kind of he kind of comes in even a little bit at an even stronger position. Um, so yeah, that that's not something that that really sets him you know, offsets him in any way and, and interestingly nobody in tampa tries to step in i mean he has an acting boss there who oversees things but nobody tries to like overtake or, or you know do a coup there in tampa so that that says something about his power at that time now what about the appalachian meeting how significant do you think that was oh that was huge appalachian was hugely significant in terms of kind of showing the general population readers and at the people at that time that uh that there was this nationwide syndicate of gangsters and they all get busted at this you know jar barber's house up in uh up in apple lake in new york and uh santo traficane is there G uh, no giancana was not there uh but there were you know pretty much every named mafia boss from all 26 families or 28 families um, and they were all happened to be there at the same time. And, you know, had they ha had the mob guys handled things differently, it probably would have just went away. But they all panicked and they ran off in the woods and it just becomes this whole to do. Um, so I think Appalachian was absolutely a a probably a top three defining moment of of the evolution of the mafia in America. Now, how did we get the Hollywood version that? everyone kind of knows when it comes to, if you mentioned the mob, it's like their first thing is Goodfellas or Godfather or something like that, which I think are interesting movies for sure. And some of it's kind of interesting. They might add like a detail that might be realistic, but like they didn't use, not all of them use Tommy guns. I mean, you mentioned the Tampa mob using shotguns, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. Yeah. That's, yeah. That was their weapon of choice. Though. That's just, I don't even know how you come up with using a shotgun as a weapon. That's a very brutal way to do it. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is the prevalence of shotguns in Florida, you know, between hunting, especially at that time period. Also, that's what they use in Sicily. Um, sort of uh, uh, shotguns were were frequently used in some of the early mob killings in, in Sicily. Um, but yeah, so the you know, the Hollywood version and the Hollywood version doesn't start with The Godfather. They they start with like right at the advent of the sound era of movies, you know, comes out during the Prohibition era starts, you get gangsters on screen. So uh, yeah, Edgar G. Robinson and Little Caesar is one of the early like iconic ones, uh, Scarface, you know, the Jimmy Cagney movie. So already you're getting the Hollywood version of the gangster right from the get go. And this continues on all the way through the 50s and into the 60s. And it's funny because there's um there's an article from New York Magazine and probably like 73, so like a year or two after The Godfather came out, and talking about how mobsters on the street are now going to see The Godfather and adapting some of those mannerisms themselves. So it's kind of like this weird feedback loop. Um, it's kind of like in the early 2000s when the FBI are bugging the DeCalvacante crime family in New Jersey, and they're overhearing the guys in the mob comparing themselves to characters on The Sopranos, like, hey, that's so-and-so, I bet that's so-and-so. Um, so yeah, there's this weird feedback loop. But uh, yeah, the Hollywood version of the, of the gangster has been there since the start, and that has certainly informed kind of that public perception of, of what, a, what a gangster is, and to some extent, the way gangsters view themselves. Do you think that some of that image was distorted for like propaganda purposes when it came to either the mafia? Because mafia ran some movie theaters and had some influence in the Hollywood, but so did the government. Like that was the hardest thing for me to understand was like, who's creating the image here? We always think of the mob figures as the bad guys, but then you find out they're working with the government hand in hand. You're like, All right, hang on a second. Yeah, I, that's interesting. I think some of it was um, was kind of 
Hollywood kind of just making it as outrageous as possible. Some of it was, you know, from the kind of the law enforcement side of let's make these guys look as bad as possible. Um, but then, you know, the mafia had some influence, certainly probably the most well known is, you know, you never hear the word mafia in The Godfather. And a lot of that had to do with the Italian American Civil Rights League, who were, um, you know, exerting a lot of pressure on Paramount when they were making that movie in order to erase all mentions of the mafia, which, of course, the irony is that Italian Civil Rights League was led by mafia boss Joe Colombo. Um, so uh, there, there's yeah, there, it, it's an interesting um, uh, history of, of that. Do you find when you give some of your tours that people are surprised that if they live in Tampa or they live in that near that area that all this that you're kind of pointing out to them existed here at a point? Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially because Tampa is a, a transplant town. Um, you know, there's a large third, fourth, fifth generation Tampa, Tampa population or Tampano population. Um, but, you know, we're an area where people are moving to all the time. So there's a lot of newer people or people maybe have only lived there five or 10 years don't know a lot about the history and are like, oh my God. And I even get people that grew up in Tampa that like heard bits and pieces, but never knew like the in-depth of like, oh wow, that happened here at this building or that. So yeah, that's pretty much every single tour I, I have people. If I'm not mistaken, I think the only one I can remember when it comes to a mob story that sticks out in my head is the guy that went crazy and I think killed his whole family or something. And it was because he smoked marijuana or something. Oh yeah, the Victor Licata murder. Yeah, it actually had nothing to do with with organized crime. Although they, for a while there, they thought it might have because his father was involved in in some bootlegging. But yeah, so so long story short, Victor Licata on October sixteenth, nineteen thirty three, um, kind of had a psychotic break. He was experiencing symptoms of schizophrenia, and his parents wanted to keep it in the family so he wasn't getting any kind of treatment or help. And he ended up killing his family with an axe. Um, he garnered the moniker the Dream Slayer. And then somewhere along the line, uh, Harry Anslinger from D.C. Uh, heard about this and, and heard a rumor that potentially the kind of might have smoked a marijuana cigarette earlier that night, which, which he didn't. Um, and But he used that case as one of the linchpin cases for the federal prohibition on marijuana. So it's um, yeah. And it happened. And it's a stop on our tour. We, we go by the Lakata house. Uh, on our tour I can safely about. say that every time I've ever smoked marijuana, I've never picked up an axe and called myself the Dream Slinger. There, the, yeah, there's um, there's a whole backstory in Anslinger, and, and it, let's just say his views on people that weren't wasps, uh, you know, <laughs> upper class <laughs> white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, but uh, uh, that was definitely something driving his agenda. Um, and uh, but yeah, he used the Lakata murder as one of the kind of the key things to to say marijuana makes you a you know, serial killer. <laughs> now, do you still pull connections from some of your research? I mean, even looking into Santos Traficante Jr.'s life, I feel like it just never stops. It's kind of like the Kennedy case a little bit. Just there's always something that connects to something. I got connected to Howard Hughes through it, and then that pulls on a million different strings from the stuff he was involved in. Absolutely. In fact, I've, I've you know, my first book, Cigar City Mafia, came out 20 years ago. I've always wanted to do an update but it still sells and the publisher's hesitant, but I'm like, I have all this new great information that I found. And, uh, you know, interestingly, a lot of it comes from the the releases of the JFK, uh, you know, the national archives, those files. Cause a lot of that, uh, the interesting thing is during the house select committee, they pulled a lot of the old FBI, just general files on organized crime. It had absolutely nothing to do with Kennedy, just background on organized crime. So there's this incredibly rich treasure trove of unredacted FBI primarily reports. Um, and, and as these new uh, releases come out of the National Archives through the JFK um, Act, or uh, I think that's what you would call it, right? Um, yeah. Anyway, there's traffic on a new traffic on a material that comes out of there. And so some of it, you know, just kind of solidifies old things. But every so often you see something new, or like you said, you know, you pull on a little thread and you're like, oh, okay. Have you ever spoken to Robert Blakey? Yes. Yeah. Okay. A couple of times. Yeah. I'd love to say I can connect you with him if you'd like. I had him on the show to talk about it. Obviously, he's the RICO organized. That's what I was saying when I was talking about the HSCA. I was like, your investigation was a little bit skewed because you're an organized crime guy looking at organized crime. I mean, he does think the CIA withheld information from him, which they're just going to do. It's an intelligence agency. But um, he definitely brings up some good information and did a really good job investigating like other kind of mob figures that kind of get brought up when it comes to the assassination. If anything, it just brought new information out of 
about them, like when they were in the hearings or where they were, Johnny Rosselli was testifying. I mean, I think it was his third time when he finally started saying a bunch of things and everyone was, he started being fearful for his life. I mean, that to me is just interesting that this person that was involved in so much could have fear like that. Yeah. Yeah. But no, he's, he's a very uh, knowledgeable individual. That's for sure. Is there anybody besides Regano, but anybody alive that you would like to focus into if you could, or at least give an interview to? Well, I'm working on a book right now on Jerry Katina. So I've been, I've been reaching out to some people that are still around that remember him. Uh, he was a Genovese crime family boss, another name that probably nobody's ever really heard of, but incredibly powerful and influential. Um, but uh, if any of your, any of your uh, viewers know where, if I can get in touch with Larry Dentico, he's a, very old Genovese crime family member who's still alive. I'd love to pick his brain because he's one of the last links to kind of that older era of, of mafia guys, although uh, he probably won't talk, but it's worth a shot. <laughs> I have a feeling a lot of these people don't want to talk. So how do you get them to you just talk to them on the phone? Like, how do you get it to where it's record to where you can actually use it or do they allow themselves to be recorded? Yeah, I, I'll let them know if I, if I, you know, I, it's always just a first kind of, Hey, would you be interested in talking about this? And, these are the parameters and you know, sometimes they say, no, you can't really force them to, but sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes they'll just give you a snippet, which sometimes it's good. Sometimes you go with it. Um, yeah. If I ever record anyone, I certainly let them know. Um, but generally I, I try to just reach out. I, I like trying to reach out through like a third party contact. Those are generally, you know, you have a buffer there to kind of, you know, rather than a cold call. Yeah. Um, and as I've done this for so many years, I've I have a much wider network of people, so I can reach out through people to other people. So that that certainly helped. Um, but yeah, early on it was a lot of cold call, and I got hung up on quite a few times. So you know, I just have to kind of persevere through it. Now, when you go into interview mode, but when you're doing research, you've already kind of mentioned some of the JFK files being some research basis and then also interviews. But do you have other documentation or things that you try and look through, whether it's like maybe websites that are dedicated, not necessarily to the individual, but that city might have a page or have a little side thing that says, oh, yeah, this is part of our history as well, too. Yeah. So I would say my primarily my primary focuses of information, certainly FBI files. Uh, DEA files, if they're available, sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Local police files, they're really hit or miss. You either get something or they don't have anything. You know, then you go through the the secondary sources, the newspapers, magazines, any kind of kind of media coverage of of something. Um, then I go through, you know, if they own businesses, what can we find out from corporate reports or corporate records, uh, arrest records. So there's a lot, especially now, it's a lot easier than when I started doing this back in the late 90s um, to access a lot because so much more is available online. So those are kind of some of the kind of I call them the low hanging fruit, like the first things you, you start looking through. And then, you know, sometimes I might have to go to an archive and actually dig through paper records, uh, go to a library and dig through, you know, old phone directories, like verifying addresses of people. So yeah, those are just some of the ways I do that. And then I try to um, utilize interviews to kind of fill in kind of the gaps and get little anecdotal stories and more of the stuff you can't get from like a dry report, you know? I think so that's, that's one of your your stories you mentioned last year still sticks in my head, which is that I, I, it was, I guess it was a neighbor or someone that was with Traficante, but Frank Sinatra had kissed the ring. Oh yeah, yeah, um, I was... Um, so yeah, it was Frank Regano and his wife, and she had it was her twenty first birthday, and they were at the Fountain Blue, and they were seeing Frank Sinatra, and they were in the front. It was uh, Traficante, Frank, and then Nancy, and then Frank Sinatra like came down and he kissed Santo Traficante, shook Frank's hand, and then said, "Oh, and we want to wish Nancy a happy twenty first birthday," like you know, in front of the whole place, and. Nancy's like, I, I think, and she said to me something effective. I think it was then I realized that Mr. Traficani wasn't just a fashion salesman, <laughs> that he had a little bit more juice than that. Because that was his day job. He worked for a, his job on record in Miami, he worked for a, a, a fashion company. <laughs> so he did wear some nice suits. Um, <laughs> do you think that you get most, I guess, more information from family members than you do maybe close associates to, let's say, if we examine Traficante Jr.? 
No, Traficante the other way around, associates. Um, I haven't had much luck with with family members. Um, but other ones like um I've had other ones where it's been more family members. It it, it kind of depends on the person and you know if family still still alive. But yeah, I, I try all avenues and see which one works the best. Well, I appreciate the time you gave me to come back on here after a year and dis discuss some more about this. You have a wealth of information that I don't think anybody could ever fully tap. Um, I'm happy that you're out there doing your work as well, too, and also giving your tours. I think that's a really good public service um, for a lot of people out there that might want to learn a little bit more of history about Tampa, at least. Um, and also the work you've done for the Mob Museum, too. It's, I saw a lot of your writings on there, and I can really appreciate that, especially for me who doesn't have any information on any organized crime crime or mob figures in general besides stuff i can relate to like the kennedy stuff maybe some howard hughes stuff um but is there a place where people can find uh any of your nine books and also any other links you'd like to promote out there as well too sure probably the easiest link that you can kind of get to my personal page and everything or tours and my books and stuff is tampamafia.com one word tampamafia.com and is what's that documentary again you said you were a part of uh dope men that's on amazon prime right now Okay, I'm gonna make sure I can link that at least into the description as well too, because that sounds like something I'd definitely like to watch. And thanks everybody for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank and stay tuned for our next episode.